2024 marks the 10th anniversary of the release of Taylor Swift's 1989, the album that turned the biggest country star in the business into the hottest pop supernova on the planet. Oh, I hear you already. Taylor Swift, here comes another one side bubble. Oi, give me a chance. I know, balanced views on Swift's work aren't really that common, but I'm staying clear of the gossip, the baseless rants and the blind praises here. I want to focus on the music, on the reasons making 1989 a key album in Swift's career, and on those features I consider missed opportunities. Hello, top patters. This is Simon Mas, your friend with a master's degree in music and the silly notion that there are two sides to each record. Come on, ride along with me. Perhaps I'll manage to make you listen to this album with a different perspective. 2014 was a key year for Taylor Swift. Her Red Tour was the highest grossing country tour ever, but when it ended, she found herself restless. Taylor wanted to grow both personally and musically, to embrace all the experiments she had done on Red and take them to the next level. It was time for a change. I was the one saying I need to change directions musically, and my label and management were the ones saying, are you sure? Are you positive? This is risky. Risky or not, the reason for the new direction was clear. Swift had flirted with electronic and pop sonorities before, but now she was at a crossroad. If she wanted to expand her pop vocabulary, she had to go all in. As she said to Rolling Stone magazine, if you chase two rabbits, you lose them both. And Taylor had chosen her rabbit. Her next album was going to be blatant pop, she said. Built on synths and drum samples. A musical rebirth as signaled by the name of the album, 1989, the year she was born, and the last year of a decade that was going to inform her new musical direction with the music of Annie Lennox, Peter Gabriel, dance pop, British New Wave, all fine and dandy, but was the end result only some kind of washed out copycat? Or was it music that could spin its own tail? Let's cut to the chase in case you can't stick around. This is an album worth getting. Done, school's out! If you're in for the longer version, you might want to hit that like button below, subscribe to the channel, follow me on Telegram for all my content updates, leave a donation and call your son Simon. Simon if it's a girl. Seriously, consider supporting the channel in any way you can to help me deliver more and better content for you. Thank you. And back to the album. Blank Space. Shake It Off. Style. To me, these are the peaks of 1989, the genuine, timeless classics. The characters are presented in quick, broad strokes, but what is left to the imagination allows you to empathize with them. The curses are infectious, happy, but if you stop thinking about it, these are not carefree songs. In style, there's joy in coming back together, but you wouldn't have split up to begin with if this wasn't a dysfunctional relationship. For all the excitement deep inside, you know it's not gonna last. The idea that there is a price to pay is right in blank space too. Love is commodified here. There's even a waiting list. You'll decide later if the high was worth the pain and would shake it off. Look, you say you don't care about what the rest of the world says, 
but you are the one singing a whole album of songs about breakups, unrequited love, disappointment. It wouldn't hurt if you really didn't care, would it? But 1989 offers you more solid, memorable, well-crafted songs. This love, I know places, wildest dreams. 1989 takes the 2010s nostalgia for the 1980s and turns it into a sonic palette. Say you remember me, standing in a nice dress. But this is not a pastiche. The originals sounded different. I'd call it a credible reworking. And when Swift and company decide to use real instruments, they sound almost too perfect to feel real. Take the guitars and how you get a girl, for example. They sound so pristine to make me wonder whether they actually use the look. In the end, 1989 emerges from other 2014 pop albums thanks to two qualities, both 100% Taylor Swift. One, the incredibly memorable melodies. They stick in your ear even after just a couple of listens. Two, the die-hard optimism exuding from the songs. Almost any chorus here is in a major tonality, they all feel like sing-along anthems. Music theory aside, one has to be an optimist at heart if they keep trying and trying to find the one, like most of the characters in the songs do. As I said though, there are songs that I consider a missed opportunity. I mentioned the guitars in How You Get a Girl, that's a perfect example of what I mean. The song narrative is simple. A lover screwed up and now they're back. They know they're wrong and they're trying to make amends. If they do right, they might have a chance to get the girl back. Now, why not incorporate that narrative in the music too? In that guitar sound. Instead of having perfect and pristine guitars all the way through, start with having a dirtier sound at the start of the song. Incorporate minor mistakes, red noises, microphones set up a tad too far or pointing in the wrong direction to get the best sound, perhaps. A bit of tape woe and flutter since we're referencing the 1980s. It's up to stuff, it doesn't have to be in your face. But then the guitar starts sounding better, the performance improves, the sound gets more focused and technically perfect. It's making amends, like the lover in the song. This would be the kind of reward you get when you listen to a song for the thousandth time and it was always there for you, like a pearl in an oyster. Most importantly, this would create variation. Something a bit amiss here. Pretty much the whole album is built around the verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus structure. A staple of pop and folk music for three or four centuries. But Swift might have added a lot of variation in other ways too. 1989 pretty much revolves around the same type of arrangements. Soft pads and bass heavy synths supporting the voice. Some counter melodies emerging here and there. Percussions rather high in the mix. Cause they got the cages, they got the boxes. It works perfectly if you're listening to just one song but it tends to become boring during the course of a whole album. Finally, the range of themes in the lyrics is also rather narrow. Taylor Swift wants to sing about the end of a love affair, fine, but being stuck with an egotistical narcissist is not the only reason why a love affair can go bad. There are about three millennia worth of literature showing us that, as Guido Leaves said, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Having the whole 1989 revolving around a single team with the same arrangement and the same song structure really does seem like a wasted opportunity to me. In fact, the songs that really shine are the ones that have something different. Say, the saxes, 
and shake it off. Yes, it does take that little. Struggle through the night with someone new. Hey, what happened to the ugly section? Sorry, I have decided to do like the pros and tell you stick around to the end of the video to find out. But maybe I shouldn't have put a chapter mark for it then? Hmm. Anyhow, you love 1989 and you wonder what else you could listen to? I could give you countless suggestions, but let's stick to three. Melodrama by Lord, covering the same young adulthood territory, referencing the 1980s, but with more variety and at time feeling more like an actual pastiche than 1989 ever does. Peter Gabriel 4 by Peter Gabriel. Since he was one of the inspirations for 1989, it's only fair that you give a listen to what I regard as Gabriel's best work. One, introducing modern sampling to the music world. I've done a video review of it, in case you care. And for the third choice... All right, it sounds nothing like 1989, but I'll go with Jag Little Pill by Alanis Morissette. If you were around in the mid-90s, you know that this is the female artist talks about the Bad Romances album of the era, and listening to it, you'll find anthemic choruses and emotional performances in the same vibe of 1989's best moments. That's it, Top Hatters. 1989 was such a resounding success for Taylor Swift that I feel a bit embarrassed to offer you my criticism of it. At the end of the day, if she manages to connect with so many people, and I'm here with you, the only lonely viewer who is still listening, it must account for something. Perhaps you want to give me your thoughts about the album and what it means for you in the comment section. I find reading your comments is one of the best parts of making these videos, so don't be shy, and remember to subscribe to my Telegram channel to have a privileged way to stay in contact with yours truly. The link is in the description, or you can use this QR code. Stick around for more music-related content. For the moment, stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye! Cause baby, now we got bad blood. Oh, Simon, so you liked 1989? Yeah, you didn't? Oh, I did, but what? Well, bad blood. What about it? People loved it. Yeah, the music is catchy, but the lyrics are downright embarrassing. What were you thinking? What? Oh, come on, we're right in middle school territory here. And you know how in every other interview at the time you moaned about your private life being in the tabloids? Well, if you put your private feuds in a song, you're kind of giving that media nonsense the green light. No disrespect, but... Heavens! Simon Mas hates my work! My life has no meaning! Wait, I never said I hate... <laughs> Taylor! Ooh. I didn't mean to make you cry!